Okay, so I'd like to welcome everybody to this camp inter training session about the community engagement model that is used by camp uh, contour lines in Guatemala. I'm very lucky to be joined by Sean, who is the coordinator of, of this camp and has had a lot of success with engaging people to restore their land through uh, agroforestry. And he's going to share with us today as to how he does this, what his community engagement model is. So over to you, Sean. That was quick. <laughs> so, well, yeah, thanks, Ash. Um, pretty excited to do this, actually. Uh, I don't always have a cheesy grin on my face it's just because I'm excited. <laughs> and because um, it's actually something that so Tommy works with us as well in, in contour lines and it's something we've wanted for a long time to to get out there to share so thanks to to you Ash and to ERC for the for this platform to do so and for inviting uh, other camp leaders members of the movement and if I understand correctly recording it also to put up on the website uh, for for the general audience anyone interested in the future yeah. Hopefully after uh, editing out all the stupid things I say, which <laughs> is bound to happen. <laughs> so hopefully you got a team of editors standing by. Uh, we'll, we'll also put it up on our website, um, contourlines.org, where you can also go to learn more about us. Also apply for grants to plant your own projects. Um, hopefully, probably not receive a grant. It's mostly a trick to get information from people. <laughs> but if you present a compelling case, Maybe we'll get a grant. Um, so if you pay attention to what we're about to explain, I'll be able to tell and that'll increase your chances. So right to it, the two things, I'm gonna answer two questions today. One is uh, where can we find land to restore? And the other is uh, once you've found that land, how do you go about working with people to restore the land? Um, assuming that you're gonna have to work with people. I was, uh, I used to be a pretty shy guy in my, my youth, didn't really, I thought I could just, you know, go out and live in the woods, <laughs> but now I'm seeing that uh, that's not the case. It's a, uh, you have to work with people in order to do this work. So those are the two questions I'll answer. And well, first, both of those questions are kind of asked under a, under a set of assumptions, uh, which we'll clarify, make sure we're all on the same page. Um, so the first assumption is that we need to restore ecosystems so there's degradation around the world, um, thanks in large part to, to humans, to us and our ancestors. And um, to have those ecosystems become healthy again, and the people living in those ecosystems to be healthy, those populations, that's a, a noble goal that we should be striving for. Um, and so, and we also have that moral responsibility, one could argue, to do so. So we have the responsibility, the other, Assumption here is that um, on top of the responsibility, we also have the ability to do so. Uh, humans, like no other species, we can uh, make massive impacts on the land. We can distribute seed. We can uh, remove invasive species. We can introduce beneficial species. We can move earth. We can accelerate succession by chopping and dropping. Um, people talk about ecosystem engineers and it's usually the example is the beaver you know because they make the dam and it affects the landscape there's also a cool video about how wolves i think it's called wolves how wolves change rivers um, another example but i think humans by far we are the ecosystem engineers like we shape the planet and i think if we decided collectively that we're gonna restore ecosystems um, it would happen immediately and i think on the bright side I think we're moving in that direction and I think we're going to see that in our lifetime, like a major shift uh, to do this. So those are the assumptions that before we get into the details, um, we just have that established that we, we must restore ecosystems and we can restore ecosystems. So with, uh, with those kind of agreed upon, um, we'll answer the two questions. So the first one is, um, where can you find land to restore? So this varies obviously for depending on the person. One that I recommend, especially to young folks um, who are able to is travel and volunteer. 
So I did that before settling down in here in Guatemala where I work. I did that for about two and a half years, 35 farms around the world as a traveling volunteer. That's actually how I met Tommy. He, uh, I went as a volunteer to work on his farm and we've worked together ever since. But that's, that's very recommended. I know it's not for everyone. You gotta have, it helps if you're young and you don't have like a house, a mortgage, family, full-time job. Helps to have a little white privilege, you know, to be able to travel for a while without needing income. <laughs> but um, it's possible and I highly recommend that. So I use a lot woof. It's called W-W-O-O-F, where you can look up farms based on certain criteria or on location and then go there and work. There's others, Workaway, uh, similar. There's HelpX, there's a few others. And also now we have ecosystem restoration camps. We didn't have it back when I started, but uh, you can go on there and find places to go, places to visit. So I think that's a great strategy. I think you gotta get out there and, and see where you can work, where, um, where that work is needed and where it's possible. So as a, as a, um, like a side note to that, like what are, what are we looking for when we're looking to do this work, this ecosystem restoration? So I think the concept to have in mind is land use, land use. So there's a lot of tendency to maybe more on the academic side to only focus on the, the ecological side of this. You know, we want to improve biodiversity, we want to um, reforest, all that is great, but it gets to the extreme where, you know, let's fence off an area and kick people out to have uh, conservation. And that would be sort of the conventional um, conservation, which has its, its share of faults. And then on the other side, there's folks who only care about the human aspect, like the anthropological side, oh, let's help the poor. But I think if you focus on land use, what that is, is it's basically the interface between humans and nature that's taking into account the ecologic and the economic, and that's land use. So you just look around, and obviously it's rural, rural areas we're talking, because urban areas are obviously residential, commercial use. But if you look in the rural areas, it's, you know, what are, how are people using the land? Is it in forest still? Has it been clear cut for pasture? Uh, most of the communities where we work um, in, here in Guatemala, it's slash and burn. So cut the forest, burn it, and plant corn. So that's the, that's the land use. And that's what you really need to keep in mind when you're looking for a place to work. It's uh, how is the land used? Also, if you're not afraid of being uh, accused of being a communist, you also have to take into account the distribution of the land. Is it owned by you know, one wealthy person? Are there communities that all have their own um, land access? So that's another important. So for example, in Livingston, the land use is slash and burn. And the communities fortunately have access to land. Most families have uh, 10, 15 hectares per family, which is in slash and burn. So that's the land use. So then you gotta develop a plan like what's, well, first, what's the problem with the land use? In the case of slash and burn, it's, well, it's destructive ecologically and it's not at all um, beneficial economically. I mean, it's great, it sustains the family with food but beyond that, there's no economic opportunity. And it's because you're selling, you're selling a crop that has very low value in competition with um, industrial corn imported from the US. So economically, it's also not a, it's not a, a great system. So the alternative, so then you have to think like what's an alternative system? In our case, we, we do mostly uh, food forests, we call it, which are agroforestry systems rows of fruit trees and legume trees planted on contour. I guess I, I'll give a little details. I thought it'd be an intro, but um, so we have 40 communities now where we work around the country. Most of them are in Livingston, Guatemala, which is the Caribbean coast. That's where we, we work, that's where we started and have the most work done. Uh, we're up to about 700 of these sites, of the agroforestry sites with about 700 families, and that grows exponentially. Uh, in terms of funding, started off doing a, a crowdfunding campaign, just asking mostly friends and family, uh, mostly using that white privilege I referred to, <laughs> to get that first, um, those first projects funded. And then from there, if we follow these, uh, these strategies that we're about to, to teach, 
it, it just expands. We're expanding exponentially. Um, likewise with the funding, we're at the point now where we actually have to turn down certain supporters. We have to be selective with who we accept funds from. Um, so yeah, that's a bit, that's a bit of the, the stats of where we are. But yeah, back to land use and finding land to work. So developing a strategy that, that uh, meets those, those criteria of, well, one, restoring ecosystems, which is what we're here for. But two, that takes into account the human element, the economics. So these systems, in order to get people to adopt them, they have to be economically feasible. They have to bring a profit. They have to provide human needs, like food, fuel, fiber, um, all that stuff. Uh, you have to take those two things into account. And I think we found that with, in Livingston with the, the food forest model, um, it's it's good for the ecosystem. We do erosion control, erosion control structures on contour, plants with legume trees, um, organic, so that it helps the ecosystem. But also these fruit tree harvests, and with the value adding initiatives, and with the agritourism component, and with what we're hoping to get is carbon credits, and other ecosystem service payments, uh, brings income. It's more. It's a more valuable, a more um, profit creating use of the land compared to slash and burn. So yeah, it's find the land and develop a, a model that works or a model that restores land and helps the people that live there. That's, uh, that's the first question, how to, find, how to find where to work. So the second question is how to work with people um, because unless you're very, very, rich and can buy lots of land and then just pay the people to do it um, you have to work with people on the land um, and i think maybe not all of you can do that first recommendation which is you know to go leave and travel volunteer on farms but maybe you're you're more um based and you're more rooted on a certain piece of land you know you have family you have you might have a house um, so in that case it's looking to your neighbors so you got to work with your neighbors and help them restore the land. So in, both, in either case, that's the second question. And that's the main thing I'm going to focus on now is, is uh, how to work with people to, uh, to restore land. So I've broken it down into five concepts, like five strategies, you could say, um, that, um, that are sort of the, the fundamental ideas behind our, our model. So one thing, well, first of all, it's, we call it the community engagement model because mostly we work with communities like rural villages here in Guatemala, but we can really expand that to be, we could call it a stakeholder engagement model because with some adaption, of course, it can be applied to any other type of situation. So we've worked with um, like women's associations, private landowners, groups of private landowners, uh, cooperatives, we're doing projects now through um, an artisan's cooperative in, in Petén. Um, we're helping other nonprofits apply the models. So it's, it doesn't have to be with a village. It can be with, you know, anyone on the land, first of all. All right, so the five strategies. So the first one, mistakes will be made. Mistakes will be made. So any... Uh, any English teachers in the audience? Any grammar Nazis out there? <laughs> you might take an issue with that sentence. Mistakes will be made. So it's it's passive. It's passive voice, it's called, it, which is kind of an Orwellian way of talking. It's usually not recommended. It's like a, like a politician trying to avoid faults for something. <laughs> a mistake was made. Who made it? Because what it does is it, it leaves out the subject of the sentence. You know, I made a mistake or you made a mistake. Um, but I did that on purpose for the, the sake here. <laughs> it's uh, mistakes will be made. It's passive for a reason. So who's going to make it? Well, probably you'll make some. But there's also thousands of people before you doing this work who um, have already made them. So this book right here, that's sort of the basis of this book. Two Ears of Corn by Roland Bunch. So you have to read this. If you're doing uh, any kind of community development work, agricultural development, um, 
you'd be surprised. I've heard people say like, oh, I've never heard of it and don't want to read it. <laughs> it's, it's ridiculous. You should go home because you're probably doing more harm than good. Um, read the book. So the, the premise behind it is, so Roland Bunch worked for an organization called World Neighbors that did agricultural development work in developing countries like Asia, Latin America, Africa for about 40 years, since the 70s, I believe. And it's basically a survey, a summary of all these projects, you know, what works, what doesn't. And the premise of that, it's kind of a sad historical fact is that most of this type of work, um, so we're calling it ecosystem restoration, but it could also be uh, agricultural development, um, but working with people to, to work on the land, the majority of that work historically fails for various reasons. Uh, a lot of money, they spend a bunch of money, go home and stuff's worse off than before. And the people that they were supposed to be helping are left embittered and not accepting of future nonprofits. That's why it can make things worse. Um, so this book is, a, it's like the Bible of this type of work. If you want to go work with people to restore land, you have to read this. Um, I read, I was about a year into the work before I even heard of it. And man, when I read it, it was every sentence is like, it's either like, like, yes, I got that one. <laughs> or damn, I wish I read that sooner. But um, yeah, it has, you have to read it. So that's, so mistakes will be made. They've made lots of them <laughs> over decades. And you can learn from that. That's a powerful thing. It's a, it's a powerful thing because all that knowledge is here. If you look, if you think of a mistake, it's a, it's a good thing because you're learning. You're trying to do something and then you're improving it through that mistake. Um, but why not just learn it all from them? <laughs> so I've made, I could share tons of examples um, of mistakes we've made, which have led to the good model that we now have. Um, that's also one of the benefits of the first thing I recommended, which is travel and volunteer on farms. I've worked on 35 farms. So that's, I asked every single one of them, like, what's the greatest challenge you face? Or, you know, what's a, a thing that you've learned, a mistake you've made? So that's 35 examples, <laughs> 35 mistakes that I don't have to make myself. I just learned from other people. So that's the first, uh, the first strategy. The, the good knowledge that mistakes are made. Be, I'd say, even excited to go make them um, because that's how you improve. But better to, to watch someone else who made them. So that's the first one. Mistakes will be made and you have to read two years of corn. All right, the second, second uh, strategy. So there are five of these are going through. Number two, start small, start simple. That's sort of uh, that's flowing out of this, the previous one. Mistakes will be made, so start small so the mistakes aren't that big. Um, it's also permaculture principle number nine, use small and slow solutions. That's a variant of that same thing. Also, so he has five principles in this book. Number two is start slow, start small. So same thing um, in two years of corn. So start small, start simple. That's my version of it. So I'll give an example. So contour lines, the name, it's on the logo here. Um, the name contour lines is kind of a manifestation of this strategy. It's one method, one agricultural method, the soil conservation method. We use lots of different methods over time with the, with the landowners. Uh, we do polycultures, rotational grazing, mulching, organic pest control. But if you focus on one thing, it's a lot simpler. And that's the only thing that we focus on when we start. So a bit about our, our um, actual community engagement model. When we start in a new community, there's three meetings in that first season. One is just to go meet them, explain the projects, offer the projects. The second one, um, in the first one, we get a list of names, like we explain it, who wants to join. It's usually everybody in the community. Um, then the second meeting, we plan a date about a couple of weeks later, give them time to clear the, their land and prepare the steaks of Majude cacao, uh, Glaricidia sepium, that's the leg legume tree that we use, that we plant on contour, get, give people two weeks to prepare it. Then the second visit is we make an A-level, usually 
just sticks, <laughs> just cut some branches. Uh, the locals, they know they use a vine as a string. You can tie it up with a, a vine and then you get a rock. And then that's your, uh, that's your, the, the pendulum for the A-level where you can get a, find a plastic bag and put dirt in it. And that's, you know, it's very simple. So we, we build this tool on the second visit. We go out to the sites with this tool and we mark the contour lines and that's it. Then the third visit, which is now we're doing it where it's two months later. So we let the sites, the sites establish for uh, two months. Then two months later, the third visit, we come back with the fruit trees and we plant. So it's very simple. So later throughout the process, then, then the next visit is our technicians go and they supervise. They also maintenance annual seed and then they gradually be stuff like like polycropping um, incorporating animals composting that that comes later but we don't uh, it's too complicated it's a problem a lot with I've noticed with bird culture syntropic as well is that the first thing that people do and the thing that people focus on is teaching so they bring people full of like theories and principles and and a million different things it's too complicated so what we do is we have we just start it's contour lines we're going to go to your land mark these lines they're marked with the, the stakes i mentioned with the leggings which re-sprout and then we come back and plant them with trees so it's simple so one method, so that's the name, it's contour lines, because that's how we start, that, that forms the foundation of these agroforestry sites, are those lines, and then all management that, that comes in the future is based within those lines. If they want to put a road through there, it's along the line. If they want to put up a fence, plant annuals, plant other trees, they're all working within those same lines. But we've, through a simple method, one simple uh, method, we've already established the site and we already have these families now involved in the projects. So that's one example of uh, start small, start simple. Another example, which is how we, how we offer the, the projects, the trees to the, the communities is that we, so what we offer, it's in the agreement, which I'll show later. And I'll show some photos as well. I saw your comment, Ash. Um, in the agreement, it's each family can receive up to 150 fruit trees. And that's that's what we offer. But we don't give 150 trees right away. So we say 10 fruit trees. You can start with 10 and you're just trying 10. It's, a, it's It works that way. So for one, it's like they get to try it. Maybe they're, you know, if, if they just get 100 trees and they realize like, oh, this is too much work or we don't agree with these methods or whatever then it's a loss, you know, but if they only start with 10, it's a smaller loss. Also, it's for us to see, because if we go to a community, 50 families sign up um, and they can all start with 10 trees. And then the next season, if they've maintained those trees well, and if they want to continue with more, and if they follow the required agricultural methods, which I'll get into later, then they can go to 50 trees the next season and then up to 100 trees the following, and then 100. So it's little by little with each family. And that's that's the way to do it. So a lot of nonprofits will just show up with all these funds and good intentions. Here's a, you know 100 trees, 150 trees all at once. And then you, you just hear so many stories like, oh, that people didn't, a lot of people just sold the trees, they didn't even plant them. <laughs> or they planted them and then they abandoned them. I don't know what happened. Yeah, because he started too big, too fast. So 10 trees, start small, start simple. That's another example. And I'm assuming everyone's following here. I saw a comment that I was breaking up. Um, it's all right, we can edit that, edit that part out. <laughs> so that's the second strategy, start small, start simple. And that leads us directly into the third strategy, which is scalability. So here I will share the screen. And I will uh, show a few things. 
So you start small, then you scale up for many reasons, including the one I already explained that um, the success rates will be higher or the loss rates will be much lower. So the, the concept here is having a model. So Tommy taught me this as well as many things. <laughs> we have a, we have a model. So, all right, let's go right to the screen share. I'm gonna show you the map. Hello, hello, welcome. All right, screen share. I'm gonna share Google Maps. So this is the this is what I use to compile the data. In the field, I use an application called Offline Maps by Siberia, spelled with a P. It's a great app. It's free, and I go out or I have interns go out and mark these sites. Then I get the file, put it onto to Google Maps. So here on this um, on this Google Map, we have all not all actually we have many of the project sites have been mapped. We're still lacking a few. So I'll zoom out to give you some context. It's the, the great United States of America. Here we have Guatemala. So the highlands where the city and Antigua are. I'm in Antigua right now. Where most, and most of our projects are here. I don't know if you guys can see the, the little hand clicker. So this is the Caribbean coast of Guatemala. The population is is a mixture of Garifuna, who is the Afro-Caribbean population. Um, interestingly, they identify more as indigenous than as African, from what I've read. They're, they're like a mixture. So this, the Africans that were brought over by Europeans landed on the islands and mixed with the natives. And that's who the Garifuna are today. So they're based all up through Belize, uh, across this is Honduras here the coast of Honduras and including they have a quite a presence in Livingston or they had sadly it's a lot of them are moving to the states and their presence on the land is disappearing so the majority of these communities let's put the community layer on so these are a bunch of the communities so the, the municipality of Livingston is about this size up to Belize, over to Rio Dulce. So it's about a hundred, or sorry, a thousand square kilometers, just our municipality. And there are over 100 villages in the jungles surrounding Livingston alone. And the green ones are the ones we work in um, so far in Livingston. But yeah, there are many more. Let's take a look at what the land looks like, the land use. So all, you can see it's all chopped up these little patches. So that's all slash and burn corn. Here's one example, one village called Tatin Village. And they own, so that's the town center, 100 families, uh, thatch roof huts. But they own all of this land. Yeah, so I know it's about 1,500 hectares that they own, including land that they have in a reforestation incentives with the government. Um, but the majority of the land they work is in slash and burn corn. And you can see like the darker patches have been cut and then burnt recently. And then the greener patches are in regrowth, soon to be cut and burnt again in that rotation. So why are we looking at the map? Oh yeah, so I was gonna talk about scalability. So back to the project layer. And we'll change the base map back to the terrain. So you can see them better. So these are not all, but many of the sites that we have in the region. So we started February 2019 on this site right here. So this is, I call it the Don Adolfo pilot site because this is loan, owned by a private landowner. It was in pasture, very degraded, only the toughest of herbs or uh, weeds would grow on it, compacted clay. Uh, steep land, all the sediment washed to the, the lower parts. So we made a deal with him, came in and um, planted 200 fruit trees, did about 1,100 meters of contour lines. That was it. And that was our first project. The guys that we worked with on that project or the, the people we employed basically, also training simultaneously, were three guys from Tatin Village. 
the aforementioned Tet team. So those are three guys, um, Don Carlos, Eugenio, and Victor. So they started off as trainees, and then the next season, May, June of 2019, we started in their community, and we that was the first fundraising crowdfunding campaign I did to fund three sites for them. So they each planted 100 fruit trees each. So that's, so for example here, that's uh, Victor's, down here, Eugenio, and this one up on the hill is uh, Don Carlos. So we started with three sites. The following season, that expanded to six, including like this one is Don Victor's son, his brother, his other brother, and a few others. Then the following season, we went up to 12. All right, so I explain this because these were models that we scaled. We replicated the model and scaled it. Um, in this case, we went up to 21 sites in this community, plus another 20 sites with women, which at the time we were dividing um, by gender, which we don't anymore. But anyway, so there's 41 sites in this community. And the following season of, well, that happened over three seasons in Tatine. Meanwhile, uh, in November of 2019, our third season working. We started in three other villages. So this one around here, La Pintada, it's a, uh, I call it the river community because you ride up these beautiful mangroves. Up here is El Cedro, which is the mountain community. And over here, uh, La Guaira Cocoli, which I call the beach community because we enter through the beach. So we started with three communities, three more communities that season. The following season, we started with six more communities then the following following with 12 more and this season i think i don't even know how many just the season um, including the new regions maybe like 20 more villages we started this season so my point is it's exponential growth all that which is based on one single model so let's zoom in to let's go to don carlos's site so this site it has 100 fruit trees. It is about just over an acre or just under a hectare, about 0.7 hectares. And it has about 600 meters of contour lines. And it cost um, $167 to, for the trees, for the, uh, the technician wages, the tools, mostly the trees is like 80% of the cost and for the transport. So this, that is, we call it a model. So we had so one site with you know x amount of statistics, x amount of cost, that can be scaled to three times, or to twenty one times, or one hundred times. Now we're at about seven hundred of these sites in various stages um, throughout the country. So that's the key right there, and that's I will I'll show you a proposal that I have used that we use to raise money. And I'll, I'll give you more details about how, how do you move this thing? Yeah. All right, so this right here is like a $50,000 document. We, so it's raising $5,000 um, and it includes 18 sites across three villages. So I took that one site um, hey, you know, Sean, we're still, I'm still seeing the map. Oh, okay. Thanks, Tommy, for letting me know. Screen sharing. There's me. All right. Okay, so here's the, the proposal. Got to make it look official. Contour lines. Livingston Food Forest Expansions. So this was after... This is when we started with those six new communities, um, which was about the fourth planting season in. So this document uh, we wrote and we sent it out to a bunch of different organizations. I, I like spammed it to like 30 different <laughs> people and gave it to our existing donors at the time. We ended up raising, I think about 50 grand with this document. So it's, so I, like I was saying, I took that one site, the cost and the amount of trees and all that with one site and just per um, like per proposal, I just multiplied it by 18. So this is to plant 18 sites 
and more or less across three villages on average, which is 27 acres of land, 10,000 trees. So I took that, that one model of a village and scaled it to be, or sorry, one, one site and scaled that to be 18. So it has one cost, which is about $5,000. So I was saying I, we sent this out to random, just anyone who looked like an organization that supports this kind of thing. Uh, most people didn't respond, a few did. And we also made more contacts through that. And so overall this document led to us raising about uh, $50,000. So it's about 10 times of, you know, one, we'll call this like one uh, round, three villages, 18 sites. So we did that by about 10 through this document. So you can see that we have our set costs. So these are, this is our cost of our work, fruit trees, tree transport, technician wage, uh, trans, technician transport, and then a little bit of equipment like, um, Backpack sprayer, only two per village. Uh, pesticides, we use neem and um, pruning shoes. So yeah, th those are the costs for, per project. On average, 100 and, oh, sorry, I said 184 per acre. So scalable models. And now we're, yeah, using the same, basically the same costs, uh, the same budget to um, expand these projects even more exponentially each season. So yeah, that's the, that's kind of the third principle there is to have to scale up, start small and then scale up. And I'm back. All right, so I'm gonna just breeze through the next two um, strategies. So, so that was number three, um, scalability, have models that you can replicate. So yeah, so I'll explain a little more. So in our case, it's the land use transition that we're doing is slash and burn corn to agroforestry. And, you know, in other parts of the world, it might be like degraded pasture to agroforestry or to regenerative grazing or whatever the case may be. But find, start with one site, find out the costs of it. And then with those costs, with that information, the information is the, that's the most powerful thing, information. So, and with that information, you um, look for more funding to expand it. You say, look, we've done this. We know how much it costs, it works. We wanna do it 10 times more, you know, or a hundred times more, whatever. So start, start small and scale. All right, the fourth strategy is, um, so this applies a lot in our case, so, the strategy is work grants, not charity. So we don't do charity. We don't give donations. Uh, we're, um, we're a nonprofit, an agricultural, a group of agricultural technicians who give work grants. So it might sound like semantics, but no, it's very, it changes entirely the, the mindset of everything, of everyone involved. So one, going back to this book, the main problem let's say it's, it's number one problem that most people engaging in this work that they come across, it's called paternalism. So what it is, is, you know, the, usually from the US or from Europe, a first world country, they come with all this money and good intentions. And what they end up doing is, um, you know, giving, it's giving stuff. And it's, and um, it's, it might sound like, oh, that's good, right? But no. <laughs> So you don't, so what you want to do is give the bare minimum that's necessary for someone to do this work, give the bare minimum. Um, I'll give an example. So in Tatina, when we started, our costs were like, so there's, we reduced our costs by 70% from the first, when we started before I read this book <laughs> to, to how we work now, the cost has come down 70% because what we did at first was, okay, everybody gets a backpack sprayer to spray the pest control everybody gets their helpers labor paid for Oh, because you need helpers to, to join you. What else? We were buying like barbed wire to keep their pigs out. We were pretty much anything that a person wanted. Oh, some of your trees died. We'll buy more. Um, so that's paternalism because what you're doing is uh, it's, there's so many levels of why it's wrong, but the main point is, well, one is costing you too much money. And two is that you're making people 
dependent and it's kind of belittling to people. It's not empowering to be like, hey, you need this help from, from us rich people. It's, um, it's not a good mentality. It's not a good mindset. And most projects just lose interest or lose all their money <laughs> and fail because of that, because of paternalism. So what we're, what we're doing then is not charity, like we're not helping the poor, um, like that's insulting. What we're doing is we're providing work grants to farmers. So if you do this work in the States or in Europe, you might not have this problem because that's what happens when, say for example, an extension agency gives a, a hoop house to a farmer or an irrigation system or fencing. Um, for some reason, because it's in a first world country and they're white, it's called a grant, <laughs> you know? But if you do that same thing here, it's called charity because like, they're brown, it doesn't make sense. So it's what well, we're doing, the same thing, it's a grant. <clears throat> so what's the difference? Well, charity is it's paternalistic and belittling for one, but apart from that, it's, it, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, it, um, uh, seeing some questions. All right, we'll get to that. So, <clears throat> so the problem with charity is that it's usually given in good faith and given to you know feel better about oneself on the part of the giver, <laughs> but it doesn't have. It's not effective in terms of, well, one like seguimiento, um, like follow up. It's like here you go, take all the stuff, and now I, I saved you. You're better. No, it's it's um, it's a grant. So, all right, so what we do, it's, it's a grant. It has a specific purpose to achieve on the land, the change in land use, like we talked about. It has a specific objective uh, agriculturally and land use wise. And it comes with conditions and it comes with rules. You have, to, um, you have to apply for it and you have to, what's the word? You have to, um, I'm thinking in Spanish, all these words, <laughs> you have to, uh, you have to be able to uh, you have to like comply with the the rules of the grant in order to receive it that's how grants work and with farmers in the first world it's like you get this but you have to do this and that so these are work grants it's not charity so what how does that also play out well one is that we like I said, you just don't give things away and that's it. One is that you have an agreement and you, you put rules. So in our case, it's um, you have to maintain the trees, obviously. You have to plant them and maintain them. Those first 10 that you get, you have to plant them and maintain them uh, in order to get more. And you also have to follow. So we're using this opportunity to um, incentivize this transition to um, like restoration agriculture or regenerative agriculture. So we have, in our case, we have three agricultural methods that are required. You have to plant the legumes, which are the Glyvercidia sepium on contour. They have to all sprout, and if they don't, you have to replace them. So that's one. Two, you have to, uh, in English, like use mulch. And so it's organic material. One, one part of that is you have to put along the contour line, just above the stakes, a, um, in English called like a dead barrier. <laughs> so it's a, it's an erosion control structure, logs, sticks, you know, plat plantain trunks piled along that line. Um, also around each fruit tree, you have to mulch, throw down leaves. That's also what the Majorica cacao, the Glyrocidia sepium is used for, to cut and throw down as mulch. All right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna show some photos. I see the suggestion, um, but yeah, last part, so the third, Thing that we do is, or the third um, required agricultural method is uh, organic. You can't spray herbicide or any chemical uh, pest control. So there's the three agricultural methods. If you follow them with those first 10 trees that you receive, then the following season you get uh, 50 more trees and then and so on. If you do well with those 50, then you go to 100 and that's how we expand. Um, on top, recently, we've added two more rules on top of the, the, um, those three agricultural rules. There's two more that are kind of like the agriculture or the organizational rules. So number four out of the total five rules. Number four is um, include, you have to include the whole family. So it's women 
have the same rights to like ask for a project, uh, receive seed assistance, and also join on the, the training days, same as men. So all right, we'll get to we'll get to photos, and because I'll, I'll tell a story about why we added that rule um, based on a photo. Share screen. So I did this kind of a flow chart to paste on Facebook and explain to people how we do that expansion. So we have, so I mentioned those three guys that started as trainees on the pilot site. Then the following season, they, these three guys, Don Carlos, Eugenio and Victor, became the first three in, in uh, their village, Tatin, to plant their own sites. Then it was six guys in the following season and then 12. So I pasted this on, on Facebook. And of course I got some feedback, some very valuable critiques. Like, hey, why is it all men? What the hell? <laughs> and I mean, I'm not gonna make excuses. Like, yeah, we were only working with men at the time. So thanks to that feedback, thanks to some consultation on how to do it from like local leaders themselves. So we added a fourth rule to the to the, the agreement now, which is that it has to include the whole family. So on the on the contract, it has to be signed by the man and the woman. And we also say that you know women have equal rights to like enter these projects. And quite a few communities now, I want to say about like eight eight of these communities, the projects are strictly run by women. Um, ERC is actually helping us with a fundraiser for two of those communities in El Store, where there's like about 20 women in each community who are, they have, they already had like a, an association and now they are the ones doing it. So that is the, so the last rule that we added is related to that. It's, you have to be organized. So if you're going to work with a group of people or a community, um, if it's like a, co a cooperative or an association, then they're already there. But in a lot of cases, the communities aren't there yet, which is they have to be organized. So to cut our, to keep our costs and the, to keep to make the projects efficient. For example, we send a technician one day to the to one village to mark the contour lines to mark all the sites. On that same day, everyone who's involved in the projects from that community has to come together and work. Um, so you have to all you all have to come on the work day. It has to be that way. It can't if someone doesn't show up, we can't like send a technician just to that guy's house. You know, the next day, it'd be too costly. So it has to be organized. Everyone has to get together. Another part of that, that rule is you have to appoint a representative. Each community has one person that I'm in contact with. We plan the dates. Um, they send the results of the supervision. They send photos. Um, and with them, I coordinate the date. Like, all right, this is the day we're coming. You have to tell everybody. So everybody comes. Um, and that's the fifth part of that, the agreement. Uh, let's do a share screen and actually show you the agreement. We worked on it. It's something, it's the result of four years of this work. I had my father-in-law um, help write it in Spanish. He has experience with um, writing contracts and managing. Cordo de trabajo. So it's all in Spanish, but I can, you can just get an idea of how it looks. So it's all on one page, first of all. It has the thing up there. So it says Contour Lines, we're an organization, nonprofit oriented towards agro reforestation. Ah, yeah. Thanks, Tommy. Always chiming in with crucial advice, Tommy. That's what I'm here for. <laughs> <laughs> all right, there it is. So Contour Lines, <laughs> you can see it now. Yes. So, all right. So we're an organization oriented towards agroforestry. We achieve our objective working through the hands of communities that understand and are interested in complying with these agreements. We sign these agreements with campesinos and campesinas who accept the rules of this agreement. So it's very repetitive and very clear. 
Um, third part. So these, the signed agreements have the objective of guaranteeing and making the, the, the benefactors responsible for complying with the objectives of our organization and for the benefit of everyone. Um, our organization exists and collaborates with these communities thanks to international support. And this support is conditional based on us complying with um, what we promise, which is establish agroforestry systems. So and then it goes into what we offer, 150 trees, up to 150 trees per person, um, some like minimal um, uh, tools, like um, pruning shears, con uh, pest control, uh, technical services, which is basically like the training and us sending technicians. Also annual seed. So we have the rows of trees and in between we plant annuals to, uh, it's another, it's another principle that is shared by both permaculture and two years of corn, and that's you need to achieve a short-term harvest to maintain enthusiasm um, and assistance. We're also kind of not promising, but saying our intention to help with um, the processing and the marketing of the harvest, which is another initiative we're starting on. And then both families sign it. Um, they sign it once, and then it says we we like we understand that we received this project voluntarily we understand its objectives and we are available to comply with this following rules and then it explains those three rule, three rules which i just explained um, plant the legumes use um we call it a bonos which is like the material organica both on along the line and along the trees um and then organic no herbicides and then like i said these are the the, organiz the um, organizational rules, which is include the whole family, include women. And there are, there are some days, like we said, 10 days per year where everyone has to come together and work communally, um, be organized. And that's mostly like the training days. And then both man and woman sign, they put their, um, that's like ID number, and then I sign and then date. So that's the that's the agreement, and that was actually that's that was the fifth of the um, the five strategies of our work is to have that agreement. So we want to see some pictures, so we get an idea. I should have incorporated that at other times in the thing, but uh, here we are. So you guys are like deep inside my brain right now, looking at. Oh no, you're not sharing the screen with that, are you? Hold on. No, we can't see the screen, Sean. You've got some questions about like the alley cropping on here. Um, there's some questions just kind of going over the expansion model um, and how you kind of went from the pilot project to, you know, steadily incrementing the number of trees that you provide. So maybe you can talk about some of the, the mistakes and some of the um, early projects that went where they, they weren't able to maintain them. Okay, let me, um, I'll, I'll show some pictures first. And then, yeah, well, I can, uh, I'll address those issues, I guess, as we're looking at pictures. So sorry, I didn't quite organize photos specifically for this, but um, we'll just see some pictures to get an idea of where we're working and what the place looks like here. Here's a photo. So agro tour. There's Tommy, and there's me, <laughs> and there's um, Victor Don Carlos to the first. We're just looking at your your documents right now, Sean. Oh, what? Okay. Sorry about technical diff. We're gonna edit this part out. So. All right. So you, you can see the photo. We can see it. All right. So here's what the landscape looks like. We got, so that's all corn. That used to be rainforest, presumably back in the day. And now it, um, now it's corn. So along the, you can see the group standing along what is a contour line. 
So sticks piled up along on contour. And these trees sprouting along that line are the Clearasidia sepium. There's us doing a class. So this is a tour we did at the pilot site. So you can see that line of um, that line of sticks with the brush piled along it. Down below, behind the guy talking with the mask, there's another, you can see another line in the distance. Lots of mulch piled up. We had, so another way to kind of ensure that people are able and also enthusiastic about doing these projects is to have an occasional event. So this event, we invited a few people from each of the communities at the time. So that was 50 people came. Um, we, we, uh, and we showed them around the pilot site and trained in like pruning, also chop and dropping of the, the, um, the Majude cacao or the Glyver City of Sepium. More tours. There's uh, showing the A level training. All right, let's uh, make it an A level using a water level. It's way better than a rock on a st on a string. Let me take a look at. So you guys want to do questions now? Let's do questions. So. Are you going to show photos? Yes. <laughs> um, how do you work out the spaces between your planting on contour? Okay, so you got a technical question of specifically about the agriculture. That's good. So let's go back to the photos. Find a photo that shows a site pruning a tree. There's some harvest from the sites being sold. So here's a site that was just slashed and then uh, they're going to plant corn the first season and but we're still going to so we're going to establish the system plant the stakes in the trees um, but they're also going to you know make use of that space for that first season and harvest uh, another thing of corn organically this time hey, sean talk about the um, steepness of the slope and how far like how many meters you have in between two contour lines all right well here's roads another uh, important that's to me that's the most important thing project you can do is make roads that work because they sadly aren't so in this climate it's 4400 millimeters of rain per year so super tropical wet tropics also we're on very steep land digging a road get you again all right so here's a site so very steep land very high rainfall so that means very high potential for erosion. And that's why these are particularly effective in our climate, the, the contour lines. So about the spacing. So we plant most of our projects. We have some that are a model designed by Mike Hans in Honduras called, it's called the Inga Foundation. And the model is called Inga Alley Cropping. So that's planting just rows, very tight spacing of a legume tree called Inga edulis. And that's, um, another project we're doing, and that's designed to plant annuals in between as you cut back those legumes each season, and throw down the mulch, and then you plant an annual, and then those legumes re sprout. So that's, and, but the majority of our projects are with fruit trees, with some with Inga edulis, but mostly with Glyrosidia sepium. So the spacing depends, the spacing between the lines where Victor here is standing, it depends which fruit trees you want to plant. So for example, if those lines are planted with, for example, limon or cacao or hakote, for example, these are fruit trees that have three meter spacing. So then the, therefore, if those are along the lines, then therefore the spacing between the lines should be three meters or it could be four. But if you're planting mango or mango, we plant at 10 meters, uh, star fruit, jackfruit, breadfruit and avocado as well. They grow much larger. And so those you want to plant. So the line, the spacing between the line should, you know, correspondingly have that spacing. So about 10 meters in those cases. And yeah, so you could do more if you want. So those, so the idea is that these, all these sites gradually fill in uh, with canopy of these fruit trees and legume trees. Uh, if you want a little more time to plant annuals in between, 
you can space those lines out a little farther. So we'll have, um, yeah, it'll basically just take longer to fill in. So yeah, that's that answers that question. Was that the question about what's the spacing between the lines? Hello, I don't see you there. Did, did, did that answer your question? Uh, yeah, Gareth, he is here. Oh, Conan, sorry, Conan. Looks like Sialta Shroi. Yeah, I, that's great, Sean. Thanks very much. Got it. Hey, Sean, here's another one. It says, what motivates the villages to join the project? How do you convince them? Hmm. So that's a good question. So going back to, um, it was the, I, I explained it under the first question, which is, you know, how do you find land to restore? And that's find a, a situation, a location where the land use can be improved, basically. So from our perspective, ecosystem restoration, uh, maybe the land use is kind of is destructive, like it's slash and burn chemical corn or it's you know, conventional grazing pasture and find an alternative one you can offer and incentivize it, find a way to make it. So that's the key. So there's different levels or different strategies, but the, I think the biggest one is just to make it economically viable for the person. So in our case, we just, I guess, luckily everyone, you know, they're campesinos, they work the land. Some people have some fruit trees, but everyone understands that fruit trees are valuable and you can produce far more, um, both food and also income per area if it's planted with fruit trees compared to the slash and burn corn, which beyond subsist apart from you know sustaining the family, as far as selling it, it's, it's not profitable at all. So in our case, everyone knows the fruit trees are more valuable also, there's the barrier to most people is that they're expensive. I mean, like I said, that's 80% of our project costs right there is buying the fruit trees. So we buy them grafted from a nearby nursery, which is a great project, by the way, Frutas del Mundo. Uh, so we support them, we buy their trees. And so we offer something that is valuable, that has a perceived value. So fruit trees in this case, and like a few tools and, and training, annual seeds um and hopefully help with like processing and marketing in the future so it's the economic incentive and i think that alone is what gets people um willing to join like i said we go to a community explain the projects offer them you know who wants to join it's open anyone can start with the 10 trees before moving to the the 100 150 and it's usually everybody signs up because people know so there's other factors though there's other factors, for example, having people trust you. So I've been working in this in that region, Livingston, for three years. So people, everyone's heard of the, the gringo campesino, they call me. <laughs> and they know that, well, one, that I make good on my promise. If I'm going to say, we're going to give you 100 trees, um, you know, as long as we follow the agreement, then the 100 trees are going to come. So that helps. Uh, another thing is I mentioned having the training days. So bringing everyone together to the pilot site to have a training day that helps a lot because one it motivates people they see they see a, a functioning established system and you think they think like oh i'm gonna i can do that i go home do it at my site improve it maybe and that helps also just get or gaining that ability to to actually do it um how to prune the tree how to control the like pest control the mulching chop and drop you know, when to chop the magic cacao, when to do this, all that, um, planting annuals. So that's it also requires like a, a knowledge, like technical skills. And having that also enables people to do this work. Uh, another, another strategy, another part of that is we have, so at first it was just me, like I would go out and mark the lands myself. And that's where I got that name, Gringo Campesino. I would go to each site because there were, there were very few at that time. But now with the expanding at this rate, we have, so I call them local technicians. We have right now three guys, as we speak, they're marking lines and villages around Livingston. These are local guys. Over time, they kind of 
if you're doing this kind of work, you're going to, and you're working with communities, you're going to see who, who they are. They're going to rise to the top. They're going to, you know, reach out, contact you. They're going to always show up on the days. They're going to show interest. And those are the guys that you eventually employ. You build a relationship with them and employ them as the technicians. So having those guys is very, also very key to helping motivate other people because they see like, you know, this is, it's not just some, you know, rich gringo with a big farm where he can, that's, that's a problem with a, like a lot of nonprofits coming. They, they do a demo site and they're like, look, you can do this. But then the people think like, no, we can't. Like you just did it because you have a lot of money. <laughs> but um, but my, so my point is to have other locals like them doing it, it becomes more real and more possible. So we have these technicians, local guys, they speak the local language, Kekchi, uh, Mayan language. And they, and I, and so we I employ them by work blocks. So for example, now it's like a two week period, um, September to October, they go to all the villages in their um, sector. So I have a, we have mountain river and uh, ocean, those three sectors are three guys. They go to all the villages in those sectors and they, well, one, they, they train people. They, they also supervise. So like I said, it's a strict agreement. You have to follow the methods in order to continue with more trees. So we send the technicians a supervise with a checklist. They go to each site, like, all right, this guy has, like he did his mulch. He did the, the barreras mortos, the, the sticks on the line. He didn't spray and he mulched the trees. So check, he's eligible to get annual seed right now and more trees next, next season. So that's another thing that, you know, how to motivate people. But I think the main thing is just seeing that it's economically viable to make that change in land use. I think that's the key. And yeah, that can, I mean, you got to find what that is. In our case, it's fruit trees. In other cases, it could be like, if you want to help someone transition their conventional grazing pasture to a regenerative grazing, for example, it might be you know, like offer the fencing that is needed or something, but some, and it should be minimal, but it should be what's needed to make that transition. And then it needs to be profitable. Like it, in our case, campesinos know that fruit trees are valuable. Hopefully a rancher will know that if he converts to regenerative grazing, for example, and grass grows faster and he produces more of his dairy or his meat, whatever, you know, that's the motivation right there. And you can start getting creative. So I mentioned carbon credits, which is something that's becoming, I think, more real, more established, hopefully. And then also ecosystem payment for ecosystem services. Check with your, your national. So in the States, we have the NRCS, which is a branch of the USDA. They pay incentives. Um, it's not the US is not the best example. <laughs> Actually, here in Guatemala, it's called INAB, the like the National Forestry Institute, they have, and Mexico has one as well, very robust um, incentives program. And incentives, it has its issues. It's not the best system that can be paternalistic is the problem. But if it's going to get someone to start that transition, it's an option. You have ecotourism, agritourism, you have forestry products, you have um, you know, hosting students from universities that have funding to do a, a study about whatever. Um, there, you can you can get creative, but the that's that's how you convince people is find ways to make it profitable, and that's also why the value adding and marketing initiative, which which uh, my wife is leading now, is is a, a big part of this as well, a very crucial part. So yeah, motivating people. That's it. Is that so? That was Hurian. Did that answer that question? We ran. Maybe you can just explain a little bit more about your context, because I know that you've been finding it a bit trickier than Sean to uh, persuade neighboring landowners to grow food forests. Do you want to talk yeah. more about how it's been going for yeah, you? Sure. Hi, thanks. Thanks for the answer and also for all the information so far. It's been really helpful. Uh, yeah, I mean, I was just asking because uh, I think it's for me quite hard to 
sort of know how to reach out to the the community around or like what might um sort of like inspire or or get them interested in in also doing similar work yeah so i was just wondering sort of what the steps that your project uh take yeah good so i'd i'd recommend start with a model so for example we have a model which is our agroforestry system 100 trees on an acre and a half and so you have that model so then you can go to someone with that and offer it to someone be like we will you know if you as long as you follow these these steps and follow these methods that we're promoting um we will we will give that to you and you know start with start small and be like we'll give you 10 fruit trees but to have it be like an official system so we have like the logo and and the and a, a written agreement so people take it seriously and just be like you know we'll start small like we'll give you 10 fruit trees and try this system and i don't know exactly their situation there but and maybe it might be something else like oh if you want them to start um for example like chicken tractors be like all right we'll start with one small chicken tractor 20 chickens and then if that goes well then you can build five of them, you know, scaling up that model. Um, yes, yeah, it's, it's hard to say with without knowing the situation, but I think it's just finding something that you can offer people of value to incentivize that that people have that impact on on the land that they change the land use. Sean, share about how you use the pilot project as like a classroom and an example early on. Yeah, so that, that also helps us to have something to show. Um, but as long as it's clear that it's possible that other people can replicate that with the help that you'll give them. Um, so yeah, we started with the pilot site. Apart from, well, first it was where we trained those first three guys who later became the first people ever to plant these projects. Actually, oh, so here's another part of that strategy. So I, part of like looking for a place to work is doing that research. Part of that research is finding out who's there doing that work. So in our case, there's a local nonprofit called Apuro Sarstun, which is like you know helping the region of the Sarstun region, um, and they do a lot of the same work. They do agroforestry, they do like fuel efficient stoves, just all the the cool stuff. And so I got in contact with them, made a relationship with them, and that's how we found these first three workers. I asked them like send three guys. I just need three workers. But three, you got, you know, anyone's going to show up in that case. It's just, you're going to pay a guy. But uh, I told him, like, I'm looking for three guys who specifically are interested in agroforestry and who might be interested in, in uh, doing this work in the future. So they sent, so this, this nonprofit sent those three guys, uh, Don Carlos, Eugenio, and Victor. Um, so another thing about having that contact, so apart from, getting those first three workers, which through them, we were able to get into that first village and start. Um, now we have the 40 sites in that village. Also through that nonprofit, Upper Sarstun, every, all those first few seasons, and even still today to this, these seasons, I, I asked them, so we're, you know, we have, we're interested in expanding. Can you recommend a village where we could go and do this work? So that actually that first season after Tatin, where it was those first three other villages, La Pintada, El Cedro, and La Guarda Cocoli, they they took me. So, um, they like arranged it with the so each each village has a council, community council. So they arranged it with them. They took me, introduced me, like here's a gringo who wants to do this stuff. <laughs> and um like, we trust him because he did it before. And so that was key to getting into those getting started. And once you're started, then it, it all becomes way easier. That part of it, of um, being accepted by people, it's just getting started. But yeah, like Tommy said, so on the, on the pilot site, we, it was where we trained the first three guys, which is how we got into the first village. And since then it's been a constant, well, one, we bring tours there. Every group that I've brought to Livingston, we go there. Um, also then, like I said, the we do training days where we bring representatives from all the communities to um, like we 
we uh, like arranged boats for them and everything and a lunch and bring them all to that site. And that site has been crucial in, in teaching people and developing our models to find funding. Um, I paid that first one out of pocket, like a thousand bucks to get that site planted. So thanks to thanks to mom and dad. <laughs> but um, so but then from there, having that first site, I was able to I have that model now that can be funded. And then I was able to that's how I did the first crowdfunding campaign using footage material and, and the knowledge and the, the statistics, the model from the pilot site helped me f raise funds for those first three sites in Tatin. And then having that done, having good videos and um, that allowed me to raise funds for the next ecosystem restoration camps. Thankfully did a fundraiser as well, actually for those first three villages. And and yeah, just just getting started is the, it's the hard part, but on the bright side, it gets easier. Uh, Ronald has his hand up. Ronald, would you like to ask a question? Uh, thank you so much, Sam, for your wonderful presentation. With such detailed, perfect work you're doing over there. Uh, I was just following you closely from the time I joined you. I wonder if at all you're having your own uh, nursery that you're operating in at the project uh, where you raise your own seedlings and also where you collect maybe the seeds, uh, you have the seed sources. And then besides maybe uh, in your operation site there, if there is some, there are some wildlife uh, within the project site. I really would wish to know because uh, some of these things are happening, especially in some of our project sites too. And how do you handle them if you are told you have wildlife within place? So if I understand correctly, it's like the multiple question. One is where do we get our plant material from, like the plants? And also about wildlife. Or was there one more before that? I'm sorry, I missed that one. He asked if you have a tree nursery and grow your own trees. Uh, and if you do, where do you get the seeds from? And do you have wildlife living in the areas where you're planting? And if you do, how do you manage that? Okay, good question. So where do we get the trees? We buy it. So the fruit trees, we buy grafted fruit trees from a nursery, which we're very lucky to have just up the river. Um, it's called Frutas del Mundo. Another gringo who's been there for, he's been there since the 80s. He was in the Peace Corps, uh, this guy, Dwight Carter. So we buy all the trees from him. And, you know, it's kind of like one of those things, like why reinvent the wheel when he's already doing it? Actually, we are have we have sent now four groups of guys from our projects, local guys, to go volunteer and live and stay and learn from him. Some of whom are starting their own nurseries, which is a cool thing for them, like a business, and also for them to plant more trees. But we don't depend on that for our trees. We buy all of them from Dwight because it's more certain and it's and it's also supporting another great project. That guy Dwight, he's he had like a big farm. He's been training guys since the 80s and he's actually given off parts of his land to them to start their own nurseries and they have like a partnership where they they split the the business so that's really cool and it's it's an honor to support them um, in terms of the legumes so madre de cacao comes from cuttings and those people have they it's used a lot in living fences so if we say like all right we're going to come in two weeks to mark the lines you need 40 stakes or 50 stakes of the clear city of sepium. It's not a problem, anyone can go find it. The only nurseries we do ourselves are for the, so I mentioned the Inga alley cropping and that's uh, Inga edulis or guama we call it here. And so we have a, a model of those projects where it's 1,500 of those per person, per site. And it comes with X amount of incentive, not cash because that'd be paternalistic it's an incentive which the, the recipient can choose something that's in line with our values, like more fruit trees, uh, sustainable, like bamboo construction, something, a uh, fuel efficient stove, which is another good business we support, um, solar panels or a kayak. 
something like that. Anyway, so the nursery is, so they set up the nursery. We give a, um, did I mention, so it's 3,000 quetzales, which is like, like 400 something dollars is the incentive. And then the project costs are mostly um, the seed. So we spend about 25 cents of Guatemalan quetzal centavos, <laughs> which is like a few pennies. Um, and we, we buy those seeds locally. A lot of people already have these trees. Actually, seed that came from Mike Hands in Honduras, the Inga Foundation, our partners at Prasarstun, everything's connected. It's crazy. <laughs> we brought them eight years ago, and now a lot of these communities have the seed. So we, so if someone signs up for this Guama, the Inga Edulis project, you give them 1,500 nursery bags, you know, go fill them. Then when they're ready to make sure that they actually do it first before we send the seed. And then the seed comes, we spend about 400 quetzales and we buy 1,600 seed, a little extra from a local community and then send those seeds to the person doing the nursery. Um, so that's the, that's the Inga Edulis project. Um, so the other, what was the other question? The uh, wildlife. So yeah, I mean, we live in a tropical region. Unfortunately, you know, because of the land use, you don't see a lot of wildlife like jaguars exist, but, but way farther into the mountain. Um, same with deer. They have this animal called tapi squintle, which people hunt. I've tried it, it's delicious. I don't recommend it, but it's like a, it's, it's like a little pig basically with a long nose. It tastes like chicken with pig around. It's anyway, <laughs> so those things exist and then all kinds of birds. So, but that that's, that's a good question though about wildlife because that leads to another theme and that is to have studies done, which we haven't achieved yet. We we're, if you know anyone who wants to come study awesome projects and how ecosystems are being restored. We need someone to do that. I mean, I've done like, what's like layman studies or uh, like amateur studies, like measuring the soil horizon change. So on the pilot site, another use of the pilot site is we've done studies where, um, for example, on the other side of the fence, which is still in pasture, I did like soil horizon study and it's only like a minuscule top layer of, of topsoil. And then just on the other side of the fence, same exact land where we had the agroforestry site, it's like 10 inches of, uh, of topsoil, of like black rich topsoil. That's a study. Another one I did was bio, plant biodiversity, same location, one side of the fence, you mark off a meter, count how many plant species are in it, simple. So on the pasture side, three, on average, three species per square meter. On the other side, on our side, where the agroforestry, it was like nine, I think the average was um, 13. So it goes from four, increases to 13 species per square meter. Um, and that's, those are the only studies I've done. But another one should be like studying bird species, studying animals, studying soil composition, and then also all the socioeconomic things that could be studied, like how these projects improve the situation. But that's, man, I had a, I had a list of goals when I started like three years ago, that was like do X amount of sites, um, raise X amount of dollars um, in different categories, have X amount of studies done. And all of the other goals have blown out of the water. <laughs> it's like way off the charts with the amount of project sites, for example. But the one that I haven't done is like studies. But we need we need that to have to be able to say to supporters, but also locals like, look, doing these contour lines will improve your soil fertility by X amount. Um, and also, and donors would care a lot, like it improves wildlife habitat by X amount. But unfortunately, we don't have numbers yet. But Sean, will. real quick, what about um, the opposite side of animals, the domestic animals? I know you've had problems with cows and pigs. Yeah, that's a good question. So the, so back to the first strategy I recommended, which is uh, mistakes will be made. <laughs> So the pilot site was just a great, a wonderful <laughs> disaster of learning experiences. Um, so it was a, a private landowner. He had a dairy operation. He still does. And we fenced off a section to do the, this project on. I wasn't there. I lived on the other side of the river on a, on a different farm. And um, 
So the main, so the thing we learned from that site was you have to be on the land. And that's why these projects with the communities work great because it's like their land and they're there working it every day. But on the pilot site, so it was a just a, a show of <laughs> various. So what would happen was the cows would see all that green and then compared to the desert that they're trying to survive in. They'd see all the green on their side of the fence and they'd just break the fence down. We had people coming in and stealing all the wood that we put along the concert lines as the barrier, just carrying it all. It was all taken and over the course of a few months for firewood. Um, another great learning experience, like don't pile up something of value <laughs> that other people don't have nearby and expect them not to take it. Um, so yeah, cows were coming in, pigs would come in and just pigs like root around, look for worms and, and uh, kill trees. The cows, so I actually told the landowner, like, I'm leaving that site. I'm not going to be responsible for it anymore. It's, it's all yours now um, because just, it was getting destroyed by cows. Um, chickens aren't a problem. But yeah, so like domestic animals, that's probably one of the biggest threats to, the, to having, well, at least in the case of uh, agroforestry sites and the fruit trees because pigs do get in a lot. People have pigs and they um, they go free and then they eat a nice dinner every Christmas, <laughs> but they're destructive. Um, chickens will prevent like, um, what is it in English? Just like having annual like gardens around your house. You can't really do unless you fence it off. So yeah, that's, that's a big challenge is the wildlife or the domestic animal life. Does that hope that answers those questions from uh, Ronald? Is that wow, the same? Thank you so much, Sid. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> thank you so much for that, uh, that explanation, really. Okay. Uh, I'm seeing. Uh, so it's that... good to hear. Thank you. Is that, are you the same? Ronald Kaboye, who asked the, this other question about um, the attitude of owners of land next to your project. It's the same person, yeah. I think there's just a delay between Uganda and Guatemala. <laughs> so I'm stuck. Oh, <laughs> Uganda, cool. So yeah, the attitude. Well, in this case, if it's these projects that are in other village or in in villages, mostly the attitude is. Um, when are you going to come offer them to our village? <laughs> That's what we're seeing is the demand for these projects are growing exponentially. Um, in terms of like private landowners, um, I don't know. It, most of them don't live here. They live in the city. They just own the land and destroy it. <laughs> and uh, that's another issue. Um, I'm seeing another question from uh, Alp Pier. What's the legal status of contour lines? So we're a 501c3 registered in the United States, and we don't have a status here in the in this country yet. Uh, we're setting up um, like a small business to do the processing and marketing side of the harvest, um, but we need something more legal um, in this country. That's that question. So we are 501c3, which also helps with legitimacy mostly. Uh, but yeah, maybe Tommy knows more about all that. He's the one who helped me set that up. So yeah, any, any other questions? So if there are no more questions, then uh, I think it's time to wrap up because we said we'd be finished by five and it's 10 past. So I want to say thank you, Sean um, and Tommy too for your for your support on the sidelines. Um, what you've achieved is really impressive at Quantor Lines and I hope that the other camps that are here and the camps that watch this at some point in the future have learned something from you uh, that they can implement on their own sites. This will, we will edit this this video and then put it on our YouTube channel for anyone who wants to watch it again. Uh, yeah, big thank you, Sean, for your time and to everyone who came. Um, Thomas, 
Alp wants to talk to you about legal status. Uh, so maybe you can exchange emails to one another quickly before we sign off. Um, yeah. Hope you have a wonderful evening. Go on, Sean. Say, well, thanks everyone for coming. And thanks to all the future YouTube people who are watching this. And if, especially for the camp leaders, if anyone has questions about implementing these models, uh, we're setting up a more um, like streamlined way of getting these models into other people's hands, adapting them to where they are so that they can restore land um, in terms of the strategies as well as the funding. And yeah, check us out. Join us on Facebook slash Contralines Agroforestry and our website contralines.org. Let's, uh, let's restore the planet. It's going to happen. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, Thank I'm going to so stop the recording John. now, everybody. Um, okay. See you soon. <laughs>